Hi friends, this is John and this is the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast where we have lots of fun talking about regenerative agriculture, agronomy, regenerating soil health and public health and what it takes to regenerate farming across the entire landscape. I'm looking forward to a really fun conversation today with Helen Athow. Helen has authored a new book that is coming out titled The Ecological Farm from Chelsea Green and you know, it's very seldom you get to engage in conversations with people who have taken some of the concepts and principles of regenerative agriculture and made them work at a production scale in vegetable systems. Particularly when you start talking about no-till organic vegetable production, there's a very tiny handful of people who've actually done that successfully on scale, and there's an even smaller uh, number of people who've done so for a long period of time. So I've been really looking forward to having this conversation with Helen and allowing her to share her wisdom and knowledge with all of us and the things that she's learned over the years. So Helen, welcome here to the show. Really excited to have this conversation with you. Can you tell us a little, little bit about your, your history and story and the life journey that you've been on? Well, thank you. It's such an honor to be here. I listen to this podcast and it helps confuse me and inspire me and give me new ideas. So thank you. That sounds like quite a compliment. They say that confusion is the beginning point of learning. Absolutely. And that's been my evolution, I have to say, over the last 40 years, trying to figure things out, becoming confused, having moments of epiphany, and, uh, and then making more mistakes. So I started in Western Montana and uh, surrounded by ranching and, and grain crops. And I went off to um, college and graduate school and studied agricultural ecology and, uh, and then horticulture plant physiology. But in between, I was lucky enough to study with or learn from Masanoba Fukuoka, who taught me wow. to really listen, yes, to natural systems. And of course, I have spent the last 45 years trying to get living mulches right. And maybe the last few years, I think I, I'm getting it. I also was lucky enough to spend a year at the Land Institute in, in Kansas uh, with Wes Jackson. And he introduced me to plant population biology. And that really made me think differently and, and add that whole ecological literacy to, to the way I approach agriculture and, and horticultural problems. And so I, I continued on trying to do both farming and understanding academic approaches to all of this. And that was confusing, but it, <laughs> it <laughs> aren't those a little bit in conflict with each other. One is thinking about systems and the other wants to reduce all the variables to one. Exactly. But I think living peacefully or at least comfortably within that contradiction is where some of the inspiration comes. And then the absolute best part for me, I farmed and did extension work and did experiments on farm. And my students would say, well, why can't you do organic no-till? And why are you still doing it that way? And of course, you know, you can ignore students, but you go home at night and then you think, well, yeah, maybe we better do better. <laughs> and when I finally went to uh, the EcoFarm conference in uh, California and met my late husband, that's when everything changed and we started partnering on this crazy soil revolution that we uh, were going through in our brains. And we said, yeah, let's develop a system where we can do no till, no spray, no weeding and grow our own fertilizer. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I love the vision. And you know, that vision that you just encapsulated is like you, I was also really inspired by the One Straw Revolution and the books that Fukuoka published on and just the idea that there is a possibility that if we understand our agricultural systems well enough, the only thing he was doing at, once he had his system refined, granted that took 40 years, but with a refined system, 
broadcasting seed and collecting the harvest. That's remarkable. And yet timing was key. Timing exactly. and and managing uh, what Carl and I came up, my late husband and I came up with was instead of focusing on crops and managing all the details of the crops, we began to manage the ecological relationships and and that changed everything. But it also meant that details matter and what some people call managing the fiddly details, we called managing the ecological details. So Fukuoka did that. When, you're, when you were right there, you realized how vital that was to the whole system. Yes. Yeah, so I interrupted you. Tell us about the rest of your story. You, you decided that uh, you would develop this perfect system that would require no <laughs> sprays and nothing could go wrong. What happened next? <laughs> so we started on my uh, on my husband's farm in California, Woodleaf Farm, and he had been developing this no-till living mulch system for about 30 years when I came into the picture. And my focus was entomology and looking at biological control systems. And so I did the monitoring. And we said, oh, look, when we when we mow the crops for nutrient cycling, which of course, I, I meant the cover crops, the living mulches, when we mow them for nutrient cycling and to make ease of orchard management flow better, we also get changes in our microbial system, what's going on in the rhizosphere, just the simple act of mowing. And we change what happens with our predators and our parasites and our pests. So for example, if we mowed at a particular time during bloom, we would send thrips that would attack our nectarines and peaches into the orchard. But if we mowed selectively every other row and maintained blooming habitat for the thrips in the ground cover and also maintained habitat for a couple of the predators of the thrips, it turns out we didn't have to spray for them. So, <laughs> so, so we began to see that these management techniques that we did, a simple mowing, had huge consequences throughout the whole system and that the timing of the mowing was vital. And then we learned, oh, wow, if you're going to work with legume living mulches or legume cover crops, you don't have to worry about nitrogen interactions quite so much. But if you're going to have lots of species diversity, grasses and other forbs, other people call those weeds and uh, and legumes that you might want to manage the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the residues that you're surface applying. And so we started looking at that as well. And then we were able to finally do no spray at all on every pest in our orchard, except there were two pests we didn't uh, we didn't have what I would call economic success with. One was on cherries, uh, spotted wing drosophila. And uh, my late husband said, well, we just need to let the system calibrate more. And uh, I said, yeah, but we're getting too much damage. And so we argued, which happened <laughs> periodically. And, uh, and we decided that we were gonna let the system calibrate. And we still didn't get uh, to the point that I feel was economic, which we called our, our tithing to ecology. And that was we wanted to have 10% or less damage to a, a crop. And uh, with the spotted wing drosophila, it was a little high. And sometimes with codling moth on apple. But since we were mainly peach and nectarine growers, we were down to about two to five percent insect damage with our no spray system. That's impressive. I well, I didn't think it was possible. <laughs> and then over the last five years of uh, farming together and minimizing our input so significantly and maintaining our yields, we made enough money that we were able to retire to 200 acres. 
<laughs> in, <laughs> in Eastern Oregon. But I, I'm being facetious, but we really did consider it a, a, a semi-retirement. We put in an orchard, we put in high tunnels and vegetables, but we didn't feel the need to go to seven farmers market a week and and, and we were able to slow down on marketing and not worry so much. But because we could do that, we started from the very beginning with a no-till orchard system and a minimum till or strip till uh, crop row only with maintaining wide living mulches for the annual crops, the vegetables. And boy, did we learn. And we began to cut out, we just cut out all sprays except a mineral mix a bloom spray to, it's almost what I would consider a homeopathic spray, if that makes any sense. Uh, we apply minerals to the blooms and it seems to, uh, to enhance their ability to, to set fruit and to suppress disease. So we did that and we cut out the very last of our spraying, which was a lime sulfur spray for peach leaf curl. And of course I sweated it out, but over time, indeed, we stopped having high levels of peach leaf curl. And I learned that it's as exciting as it is in terms of activity in the rhizosphere, there's a phylosphere. Indeed. <laughs> exactly. Who knew? And that if I stopped killing the microbial populations with my lime sulfur spray, I might actually start getting biological control organisms to kick in. And then we wouldn't see some of the diseases that we've been seeing. And I haven't monitored that as well scientifically, but in pure observation, I would say that's that's actually occurring. Isn't that amazing? I'm sure it must be a lot of fun. <laughs> it must be a lot of fun. So, Helen, this is a, this is an incredible story. You you've shared so much for us to unpack and to dig into. I scarcely know where to begin. You retired from the farm, semi-retired from the farm in California to the farm in Oregon. Can you tell us a little bit about the scale what was the scale of those operations and what were your primary crops you mentioned you were working with stone fruit and cherries and apples yes uh, so so actually uh in my book i go through the the journey that encompasses three farms my farm in montana was uh, six acres of purely vegetables with just a home orchard the farm in california was 26 acres of basically all fruit crops, uh, eight acres of peaches and nectarines, and then cherries, apples, and pears, and a little bit of vegetable production, but you know, less than an acre of vegetables. And then the farm in Oregon was a two acre orchard, well, two and a half acres of orchard, and about an acre of vegetables and a little bit of high tunnel production. And what has been the diversity of different vegetable species that you've worked with? Well, in Montana, I, uh, because I was the extension agent, I didn't want to compete with local farmers. So I decided that I would be the field grown tomato and red pepper queen. And so those were, uh, those were my main crops. But to maintain a rotation, I had to do uh, brassicas and, and onions and uh, cucurbits as well, but mainly tomatoes and peppers in Montana. And then in California, the vegetables that we did were cucumbers, trellised cucumbers, and of course, tomatoes and peppers. What a rich lifetime of experience. You know, Helen, it really is an honor to speak with you because I'm not aware of very many people who've been on the journey for as long as you have been in this particular type of domain. And so I'm really grateful to be able to talk with you. You know, you described this vision for a an ecological management system, a farming system where you're not spraying, you're not applying inputs, you're not doing most of the things that people do. So the obvious question becomes, what is it exactly that you do do? Boy, that is such a good question. And I'm so glad you asked it because 
when I was in my 20s and learned from Masanoba Fukuoka, he talked about do nothing farming, but there were all of these mental things that were going on and watching and timing of the minute management. So in our system, there's quite a bit more management than in Fukuoka system, but it's the timing that is really vital. So starting with the fruit system, which I have to say has been really effective. The no-till or what I'm now calling a minimum till vegetable system is still evolving. The yields are good enough, but haven't met the, the yields that we had when we applied lots of compost and did lots of tillage for, you know, more conventional tillage. But the fruit system, for example, basically what we do is once we've got the trees, we've got them planted, we've got the living mulches in between the trees. So it becomes managing that residue and managing it in a way that we multitask with both nutrient cycling and habitat building for biological control organisms. And so what we try to do is pay attention to the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the residues. And in the early spring, we'll, when the trees are just starting to bloom and when they seem to have the most pest issues, by the way, we try to mow only underneath the tree and leave the alleyways to grow up and be wild and full of cover and sequential season long blooming for predators and parasites and for birds and snakes and frogs and everybody that's part of our free ecosystem provider system. But we want to diminish the competition in the tree roots when they're really starting to take up their nutrients. And we want to mow in especially the grasses when they're young and succulent and the carbon to nitrogen ratio is lowest. So highest nitrogen, lowest carbon that those grasses are going to have. Later on, when the clovers and the alfalfa and some of the other forbs are more prevalent in the mix, then we can, you know, think about their carbon to nitrogen ratio. So too many nerdy details, I know, but this is this is this is why we want to have this conversation is to get into the nerdy details because I'm sure if I don't ask the questions, lots of people will be left wondering and saying, I want to do that. How exactly do I go about it? Exactly. So so we mow early in the season, but we still leave habitat for the beneficials. And then as the season goes on we uh, of course we don't do any tillage and we don't do any spraying for pests but at bloom we do this wonderful uh, mineral mix spray that my late husband researched for many years in the 90s and then we have evolved and basically it applies things like manganese and zinc and iron and sulfur and if it's a really rainy season during bloom we might up the the sulfur and use it as not only a nutrient but as a protectant as well from disease organisms but not too much because we don't want to kill off some of the natural yeasts and some of the beneficial microorganisms that we have found in our research are in the blooms and on the leaves we found a native orosidium bacillus or i'm not saying that properly it's a it's a native yeast that is very important in suppressing brown rot disease, for example. And so if we sprayed too much sulfur or too much lime sulfur, we killed it off. So where is that balance between adding nutrients for the tree, suppressing the disease causing microorganism, but not decimating the beneficial microorganisms on the foliage. So obviously we don't have all the answers yet. I know that will shock you, but, <laughs> but, we, but we are trying to learn them. So we, we put on this mineral mix spray. It also has seaweed. It also has uh, 
azomite, which is a, a mineral. And what we believe it does is to also coat the blossom and protect it from things like the brown rot organism. So we do that and then no more sprays, no more sprays. And we just monitor the beneficial insects, the predators and the parasites, both the flying predators and parasites and the ground dwelling. We, uh, we now realize, for example, how vital spiders are to our biological control system. There's some good uh, science from um, Washington State on that, but we've learned and have identified all of these different species of spiders that stay on the ground and that also move up into the trees. And I didn't bring it with me, but I, I have my pinup spider calendar for 12 months of all the best spiders, but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll have to look at the book to see pictures of the spiders. I know we, many of our listeners, and we, we know this when we think about it, but we think in terms of ecosystem services and the benefits of all these different species, how easy it is to disrupt that with our modern practices. I mean, how many growers are putting on mite sprays for acaricides and are destroying their spider population? Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Exactly. So basically then we, we begin to mow a little bit more and a little bit out into the alleyway as the season progresses. And then by the end of the season, we mow it down to a golf course as the leaves start to, to turn color and fall. We want to recycle the nutrients from the tree, right, with both the prunings later in the winter and with the leaves that fall, it all goes back to the soil. So we mow very heavily in the fall to help with nutrient cycling and because we have voles. And to manage voles, we of course have the snakes who are in that living mulch and all of the other uh, wildlife that come in and go for voles. We have owls and hawks and things, but we still don't want voles in the orchard overwintering, especially under the snow. So we mow and then we do a last irrigation and encourage the voles to go downhill into grass that we leave tall for them. And we make the habitat within the orchard a very bad place to overwinter for voles. So that's the orchard system where we've had great success. I would love to tell you about the vegetable system where I think that our no-till uh, has not been as effective, and so we've moved to what I call a selective strip tillage. We definitely want to talk about the vegetable system as well, but I feel like we need to bookmark that because the okay. topics, the questions that you've raised for me in your orchard system, we could probably fill an hour with on their own. <laughs> um, so let's let's dig into some of this. From what I understood, you are essentially doing two things. You're mowing multiple times and you're spraying once and that's it. Is there anything else that you... Um, obviously, there's the pruning and, and the harvest and the, the tree care. And thinning. But, yep, yep. And thinning. thinning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. All right. So let's talk about the mowing and the living mulch a little bit more. What exactly is your living mulch? What are the species composition? Or perhaps a better question is, what are you planting? How has it evolved? And the partner question to that is, what is your mowing? You spoke about the value and importance of, of mowing timing and placement uh, in the row, but what is your season long mowing frequency? How many times are you going across it in a year? That's a good question because it has indeed evolved. When I started using living mulches in Montana, I would plant them every spring and then I would replant them every spring and then I would, the following year, I would till them in. So it was more like a year long cover crop, right? I would use legumes because I was a nitrogen hoarder. I was all about nitrogen. And of course, the legumes were so much more easy to manage with their low carbon to nitrogen ratio and their succulent, easy to decompose. So every spring, I would till them in and I would give the soil microbes this huge meal of lots of nutrients and 
And they would feel a little like we feel after a big Thanksgiving dinner when you're kind of sluggish <laughs> on the couch. And then I realized that I could start leaving islands of undisturbed living mulch from the previous year each spring. So I started doing a little selective tilling. And then I realized that, well, maybe I didn't have to be such a nitrogen hoarder. That's a long story in and of itself. And soil tests helped me realize that, wow, I was getting excessive nitrogen levels, nitrate nitrogen levels in my soil and seeing a little bit of the signs of high nitrogen. I can tell you why you had nitrogen excesses in your soil. Please, and I think I know too. <laughs> it's because you weren't applying any. <laughs> no, it's, I said that as a joke and to be a bit facetious, but it's absolutely true. If you want to shut down that system from functioning effectively, it's really easy. You add nitrogen fertilizer and your soil will deplete of nitrogen. Exactly. Back to that living root concept, right? When you minimize your tillage, nutrient cycling and recycling starts. But let me stick to the question because I'll get easily distracted. So started with legumes and started planting annually every year. So of course I had the cost of cover crop seed every spring, right? So when I moved to Carl's Orchard, we would renovate the orchard maybe every 10 years, but otherwise it was no till. And it would start out with 5% legumes and then a mix of grasses. And then the weeds would come in for free. We didn't have to plant them at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I am being facetious, but, but it turns out that the diversity of forbs or weeds in the living mulch at Carl's Orchard or our orchard in, in California, Woodleaf, turned out to be really vital to the biological control system. That we had different things bloom sequentially at different times throughout basically 11 months of the year in California, providing pollen and nectar and seed for all of our free ecosystem providers. So that diversity became important. So we didn't have to seed, but every 10 years or so, and in the book, I, uh, I go through what, what we seeded, all the different uh, species, and I also list which of the different species supported what beneficial insects at what time of the year. So I, I think that's the kind of thing we want to pay attention to. And then when we got to Oregon, remember, we were trying to do this minimal approach, no-till. So we had a 50-year-old pasture that had moved already to weeds. Thank goodness we didn't have to seed weeds. And... <laughs> <laughs> and we had alfalfa and red clover and white, a couple of different uh, white clovers. We had uh, some annual grasses, but mostly perennial grasses, the main being orchard grass, Timothy grass, some of the bromes, and oh, about uh, 15 different species of weeds. Uh, some deep rooted perennials like chicory and um, and then some lovely little annuals that would bloom early in the spring. So we said, well, let's see what happens if we just did no till. And so we, uh, we cut a bunch of hay and we put about what would constitute about 50 pounds or about a half a bale of hay on every place where a tree was gonna be. And we let that just be mulch and then we gave it a couple of months and then we dug the hole and planted it. And then we started the mowing process. Can you give me some insights in the orchard system? What was the number of mowing passes that you made in a year? Oh, yes. And uh, my brilliant husband, being uh, one of a people that think in this engineering way, uh, measured exactly how many mowings and exactly how much diesel bless his heart. So it was usually about three to five mowings, you know, depending on how things grew, uh, three to five mowings per year. And it, uh, it was about 10, 10 gallons. That's of not that many at all. No. I, I was expecting you were going to say a dozen or more. Oh, no, no. Uh, more mowings in the vegetables, but less in the orchard. 
uh, so about three to five and uh, about 10 gallons of diesel per acre, a la Carl Rosado's measurements. <laughs> that just seems like entirely not enough work to justify having an orchard. <laughs> Yeah, you know, if it weren't for thinning and uh, and harvesting, I would still be doing it. But I need to tell you that as an old lady for the last three years, except for harvest, I was able to manage that orchard almost entirely by myself. Wow, that is impressive. So let's talk about thinning a little bit because obviously the industry standard is chemical thinning and I can't imagine that you're doing that. So how, how are you managing the thinning? Yeah, I have to admit, I've never figured out uh, organic chemical thinning, although people certainly have done some research on it. But again, we're trying not to spray. So hand thinning, uh, it's a laborious process, but it's one of the, the three places where the labor goes, uh, pruning, thinning, and harvest. Uh, so yeah, it's all hand thinning. So how uh, I would guess that you're, you try to eliminate or not eliminate, but to reduce the need for hand thinning as much as possible through your pruning practices partially. Exactly. And, and uh, so we are trying, I did not do as good a job after I lost my husband, but we did try to bring the trees down so that uh, number one, we didn't have to use ladders. And number two, you're right, we didn't have to thin as much, but especially on the, the species uh, that I really liked, I would, or the varieties that I really liked, I would tend to uh, to let them grow taller than than we should have. So, <laughs> yeah. And then with the hand thinning, was there a? Did you have a particular priority? Obviously, you probably had a lot of that to do since you were exclusively relying on hand thinning. What stage of fruit development did you try to get that accomplished? I would start when the fruit was marble sized and try to be done by the time it was golf ball size. And I would do the earliest peaches first, all the peaches first, and then move to things like pluots. And if I didn't get to pluots, we would just have smaller pluots that year. <laughs> all right. I'm not losing sight of our conversation around the vegetables, but we're, we're not done unwrapping the, uh, the orchard here yet. You mentioned that on the orchards uh, system, you eventually arrived at the stage where you only had some residual challenges with SWD and codling moth. I'd love to hear more about your journey of disease management and insect management. What were some of the things that you learned along the way that contributed to successes with other specific diseases and insect pests? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so understanding the biology of the insects uh, was, was basically my job. And we learned that with all of the other pests, we wanted to not mow to encourage the beneficial insects, but with the Drosophila, we wanted to mow underneath those cherry trees and have low humidity because the Drosophila really liked the humidity. And so if we could have it dry underneath the trees about the time the cherries were just starting to color, and well, even when they were green, that that was our best way to what I call shift the balance towards the crop and towards the beneficial insects and away from the pests. So understanding the Drosophila really like that high humidity, making sure there wasn't much high humidity underneath the tree, but near the cherries, say in the row where there were persimmons or pears, we would have the higher living mulch where we did have blooming plants and we had the cover for the beneficials so they had to move in but they didn't have to move in from a distance one of our goals was to make sure that our beneficial insects didn't have to commute to work they could live right where they work so that their habitat was right where the tree is not in a hedgerow not in an insectary but right underneath the tree but with drosophila we mowed and mowed and mowed early in the spring underneath the tree, watched our irrigation and tried to keep it dry during that period when the cherries were just starting to ripen. Uh, the other thing that we did, of course, was 
when we picked cherries, we moved them immediately to the cooler and kept them at uh, as cool as we could so that if there were any eggs, they weren't able to hatch and turn into those worms or those maggots that everybody hates to find in their cherries. It strikes me that the the strategy that you're describing for the SWD is a parallel to that of what you were using for the voles, which I've heard referred to as a push-pull strategy, where you are creating ecosystems, ecosystem dynamics to move them from one place to another place. Brilliant. That's exactly it. Thank you for pointing that out. That I couldn't have said it any better. In fact, I may steal what you just said and put it in the next book. <laughs> well, given the conversation we've had and the amount of stuff we've talked about already that hasn't made it into the first book, I do think there does need to be a next book. <laughs> so what were some of the diseases and or insects that were a challenge for you early on that eventually got resolved and just faded into the background? Uh, oriental fruit moth on peach. We used to have oriental fruit moth inside peaches, uh, which is, you know, the worm inside peach you hate to find. And it just dissolves. But I need to tell you a wonderful story. I think I think I can uh, I can do this without throwing the new owners of the orchard under the bus. So when we sold the orchard in California, they wanted to continue with the ecological management, but they decided they wanted to have chickens and goats. So they let them graze in the orchard. And then, you know, it's hard to be doing all the work in the orchard when you have tall living mulches. So they started mowing more. And when they mowed more, suddenly they started having oriental fruit moth damage again. Then they started having codling moth. And by the third year, we hadn't brought in bees uh, for many years because we had all of our native pollinators. They suddenly realized they didn't have bees. So here's the joke. They said, we've gotten rid of some of those plants that were in the orchard, some of those weeds. Where can we get the seed for some of those weeds? <laughs> And of course we laughed, but basically what we had to come back down to was you can't mow as much and you have to mow selectively. So you, if there's a crop that you're working on, okay, sure, mow every other row to make it easier to work there. But especially when oriental fruit moths are flying, we want to make sure that we have lots and lots of undisturbed habitat. So that was one of those happy mistakes that uh, taught me a lot. Did you used to historically have challenges with uh, powdery mildew? You mentioned brown rot on the stone fruit and how you identified a, um, you could say a microbial antidote or something that outcompeted it. Were there any other foliage diseases that you struggled with early on that disappeared? Yes, in the California orchard, we never had the courage to stop spraying lime sulfur in the dormant season for peach leaf curl. It's only been the last couple of years in the Oregon orchard that I had the courage to stop spraying for it. And, and I, I have to say the first year, uh, there was quite a bit of peach leaf curl and I didn't invite anybody into the orchard until the peach leaf curl had dropped. And I forgot to mention that with this mowing system that we do, we're also encouraging below ground biological control organisms. So we're, we're doing this continuous feeding of the rhizosphere instead of what I used to do, which was add compost and cover crops all at once for the microbes. The goal now is steady residue application, the three to five times a year and regular decomposition rather than all, you know, all at once. So as we do that, if leaves that are diseased fall into the system, we're mowing them in, right, with our, our selective mowing, and the microbial populations are basically controlling them. Or as my late husband used to say, they're eating up the bad guys. We can talk about these conceptual frameworks, these hypothetical frameworks to say that environment determines genetic expression and that if you manage the environment, if you manage the ecosystem, it's going to determine who lives and who dies. And 
We know that to be true, but it's very different to have a conceptual conversation versus a very real hands-on conversation to say, yes, this happened and this is happening. It's really exciting. Exactly. And, and that's another reason that we evolved. Well, Carl was already there, but I evolved from in my Montana farm, just having this lovely clover or other legumes. I use snail medics, for example, but more of a monoculture of a cover crop, or at least just a couple of species to this 40 or 50 species hay crop that we now use as a living mulch because all of those different plants have different rhizosphere interactions. They have different root exudates. They're encouraging different microorganisms at different times in the same way that that sequential bloom that we have encourages different above ground predators and parasites at different times. So I wish I knew I wish I knew everything that was going on underground. And of course I don't, but, but the last, the last five to 10 years, as I go through the literature, we're finding out all of these things that my brilliant husband intuited that there are different root exudates from different plants. And as you mow selectively or till or do all of these management techniques, you can actually change the rhizosphere. That's remarkable. Isn't it? Sorry, go ahead. It is really the plants that determine soil biology and not the other way around. And I think that's uh, beginning to be much more appreciated than it was even very recently. One of the pieces I want to dig into a bit further, you spoke about how you on the Montana farm were a nitrogen hoarder, and then your thinking evolved from that. How did the timing of the mowing in the orchard, how were you thinking about managing nitrogen and managing uh, nutrients with the mowing at different times? You, you mentioned that, if I recall correctly, in the case of cherries, you wanted to have a flush of available nutrients and you were mowing early. Or maybe I, maybe I was thinking of something else. That was actually all the crops, but all the peaches, we would go in as soon as we got that first three to four inches of that, you know, brand new green spring succulent growth. That's when we'd go and mow, both to suppress the grasses in the orchard, because I, we love our living mulches, but they also can compete with our crop, right? And so we would mow them early and then I would also mow because the, the three main nutrient sources for the orchard in our grow our own fertilizer are that we prune the, the trees and then the prunings are rotary mowed right back into the orchard. So we, we mow back the prunings, so recycled nutrients. We mow in the leaves as they fall in the fall. And then periodically we mow the living mulches at different stages of growth and different carbon to nitrogen ratio. So early in the spring, when they're green and succulent, low carbon, higher nitrogen, and later in the summer, when they're stemmy and more senescent and higher carbon. So that we're constantly adding different kinds of residues, right? We're adding different residues. Well, it's the same residue, but different carbon to nitrogen ratios throughout that growing season, if that makes sense. As thoughtful and as intentional you were and are at uh, with all of these different management practices, I'm curious about how you approached residue management and the positioning of that residue. There are increasing number of growers today who are playing with mow and blow mowers, growing cover crops in the alleyway and then banding them onto the tree row as a form of mulch on the tree row. How are you positioning the these various uh, mowing applications and the residue from those applications to facilitate optimal decomposition and the various benefits that you were looking for? 
Absolutely. And so you're going to laugh, but uh, the best tool for the orchard for our mow and blow, because that's exactly what we were wanting to do. And we wanted to place it as close to the root system as possible and still leave that alleyway undisturbed. So we, we had a 10 foot rotary mower that we would use at the end of the season, right? When we're mowing in the leaves and, and doing the vole habitat changing but for the most of the mowings we would use just a little Husqvarna riding mower and we would just go down and get you know not a, like a 48 inch or or you know 40 inch area right underneath the tree and then blow it right towards the tree and the alleyway didn't get blown in till later in the season in the past, we've made recommendations or we, we've proposed the possibility of growing legumes in uh, cherry orchards and in apple orchards in, in the Pacific Northwest. And we get an absolute allergic reaction to the possibility of having legumes in the orchard because of the concerns of voles feeding on the nodules and the attractiveness of legumes to voles. Can you briefly describe your vole management? But I, I am curious, what, uh, what has the final outcome of that, Ben, are voles a serious challenge for you at all? Or are they a non-issue that you don't even think about? I wouldn't say they're a non-issue. No, we think about it. Well, let me, let me say it this way. Are they a non-issue with your, with your current management strategies? We haven't had a uh, vole damage, but I, I think we manage for it. And just the way I told you that during the, the season, we have Oh my goodness, we have coyotes moving through. I have two dogs. We have my my husband used to say that we had a one cat per acre policy. Uh, we don't quite have, <laughs> we don't quite have that anymore. But and then we we do have uh, so we have wildlife taking care of the voles. We have these these big rubber boa snakes. And I have to tell you, I love all the organisms, but um, but snakes are are not my favorite uh, to run across in the orchard. Uh, but the rubber boas will actually go down the bowl holes and go for bowls. So during the summer, we have that going on. And then of course, we're mowing right next to the tree, right? And especially if they're young trees and more vole susceptible. And then when the voles could be problematic is in the winter, when they are looking for overwintering homes or god forbid it snows a lot and they're underneath the snow so that's when we do what i mentioned and try to what was that wonderful term you used we move them away oh, a push pull strategy push pull we do the push pull strategy <laughs> and we we mow around the orchard and within the orchard but we leave an area that the voles can move into where the grass it, it remains high so we uh, we and then we at the very end we have this wonderful irrigation system uh, we have a gated pipe irrigation system so i can flood uh, down the hill and uh, so after I've done all that mowing and the leaves have all fallen and we've done that final mowing, we also do a, a flood of the trees so that the voles say, oh, well, this is really an uncomfortable place to be. And they, they move down the hill where we don't mow and we don't flood and they overwinter there. When we think about flooding and flood irrigation, I was about to ask you the question, are your trees on mounds or anything? Do you contour the soil at all or is it all perfectly um, matching the landscape? It's become a little contoured because over time, over the years that we mow and blow the mulch into the into the tree, there's a bit of a con a, a little bit of a mound, but no, we never mounded them because we did no till, remember? So we couldn't mound because of no till, but we are on a, a slope, uh, so the water does move downhill. Got it. You know, the I find it interesting the progression of diseases and insects and and the way that your system evolved and how they uh, faded into the background and ceased to be a problem the fact that you're left with um, spotted wing drosophila and codling moth being an issue after this amazing journey i find this really intriguing and pronounced parallel to the way we see many systems evolving what those two pests have in common is they primarily infect the fruit, not the leaves. And we consistently see that the fruit is the last location on the plant to have 
exceptional nutritional integrity. It usually remains the weakest location on the plant the longest because of its extremely high nutrient requirements and nutritional requirements. So it's interesting to me that kind of everything else faded away with the exception of those two. And I don't have a tremendous amount of experience, uh, maybe our team does that I'm not aware of. I don't personally have a lot of experience with codling moth, but we were able to get rid of SWD entirely with nutrition management on a number of different crops. And so I just, uh, I'm salivating at the, uh, the idea, the possibilities of taking all of these, this ecosystem management approach and combining that with a nutrition management approach. And um, I wonder how much you could accelerate the system's overall evolution and how many mistakes you would have to learn from. Oh, I think that's a really an exciting thought. And, you know, you're going to get me off on another tangent. But one of the things that we noticed over time, we were known for our great tasting peaches in California, and they, they tended to be darker colored. So you'd go to market and most of the peaches were kind of yellow with a pink blush some of ours are solidly red. And so we started doing some nutritional analysis, of course, you would say. And we came to this a little later, though, I'm sorry to say, uh, John, but we did. So we started looking at minerals and didn't get as well into, because it's hard and expensive, but vitamins and antioxidants. But it turns out that the brightly colored fruits, the darker reds and the darker oranges, have higher antioxidants and higher vitamins. And there's a, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but there's a nutritional relationship. So as you do the carbon farming that we were doing, decrease the nitrogen in the peaches and increase the micronutrients like the manganese and the zinc, what we got were these higher antioxidants and The antioxidants, of course, are the natural immune system of the plant, which made them less susceptible to diseases. And of course, also for us, we want the antioxidants in the fruit because it makes us less susceptible to disease. And then as I was writing the book and going through the literature, I found this wonderful paper looking at as the nitrogen decreased in fruit uh, and peach tissue, and the vitamin C content increased, brown rot decreased. So decreased nitrogen, increased vitamin C, decreased brown rot, a better tasting fruit, higher in vitamin C, which is what we want. And now we are at the place where we can talk about food as medicine and feeding our microbiome what it needs to support our own immunity. Bingo. And, you know, what strikes me, Helen, is that the... the the farming system, the the ecosystem management that you're describing is you are fundamentally, you're seeking the ultimate expression of managing the microbiome, optimizing the microbiome, keeping the soil cool, keeping it shaded. You're thinking about what's happening in the rhizosphere. You're thinking about the rhizosphere development of the microbiome with the diversity of plant species and all the interactions that they have. And you know, I've tried to communicate this in different ways using different language, but it occurred to me just recently that from a crop management perspective, from a farm management perspective, I think we would be well served to consider plants as creating none of their own compounds, none of their own phytohormones. I think we would be well served to say, you know what, plants plants are not creating their own plant secondary metabolites. They're not creating their own anthocyanins, their own vitamin C. That the the contribution of these phytohormones, these phytonutrients is coming from the microbiome. And I don't believe that's entirely true. It's my understanding that plants have the ability to synthesize some of these compounds on their own. But then again, I don't know that anyone has really looked to see or if it's even possible to measure how much of the end of fights are able are are contributing to the synthesis of these phytohormones but the real as as i see it we know that we have all this biology in the roots uh, uh, rhizosphere that we call pgprs plant growth promoting rhizobacteria why do we call them that because they synthesize hormones and contribute them to the plant and we know that biology synthesizes many of these phytonutrients and contributes them to the plant and after a while i'm left wondering and asking the question uh, hang on a bit here. 
what proportion of the phytonutrients inside a plant are actually being synthesized by the plant and what proportion are being synthesized by the biology that's living in the plant. Because we now know that we have fungal endophytes and bacterial endophytes inside every single plant cell. Anyway, it's a question that I have, but from a, from a management perspective, I think we would be well served to think of it as it's 100% coming from the biology, and the better we support and sustain, sustain the biology, the higher our concentrations of phytonutrients and nutritional integrity is going to become. And your ecosystem management is doing that extraordinarily well. Oh, I'm so excited that you're saying that because now I'm going to um, move from anything that I have said that's supported by science and go into wild speculation. So, <clears throat> so I think what you have said is exactly what's going on in my orchard that I don't understand why it's working so well. We have this no-till system. I wish you could see the pictures. It's so competitive. We have all these grass. I have seen the pictures in your book. Everyone needs to get the book and look at the pictures. It's uh, it's the ultimate definition of what clean farmers would have conniption fits over of being a messy farm. It's a beautiful messy. It's lovely. <laughs> Ecology is messy, but but I keep after being told forty years ago and and most of my life that this wouldn't work. That there's too much competition. And, and we haven't added any nitrogen fertilizer. We haven't added any fertilizer since 2016 when we planted the trees and my husband put down a mineral mix in every tree hole. So we had a mineral mix in every tree hole. There has been no fertilizer except the living mulches reapplied since, let's see, 16 since 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, seven years, seven years, and there's the competition. And I think the reason it's working is just what you said. We are managing to encourage the microbial community and the beneficial insect and free ecosystem community. We're also trying to encourage the trees but we're not just feeding the trees. And so the trees are cycling and recycling nutrients. The microbial community is cycling, and recycling nutrients. And someday, don't you think, John, someday we're going to have to add some outside nutrients to those trees again. But this year, you should see how green and beautiful the leaves are. They don't need it. What do you think? I, uh, I'm hesitant to speculate because I'm concerned people might think I really went off the deep end and went, became really <laughs> heretical. But uh, my standard answer has been that, you know, we can, measure, we can measure the soil's total reserve nutrients. We can see what is present in the soil's geological profile. And we can identify when we look at the, what the crop is actually removing, and we can do the math and say, okay, we have 100 years worth of manganese in the top six inches, another 200 years in the six inches below that. So we can, we can do that type of math. And for different types of geological profiles, we'll find that some minerals are simply absent. Some foundational parent bedrock material doesn't contain selenium, and some doesn't contain enough molybdenum, and arguably it might need to be added. But then, you know, I'll join you in going into wild-haired speculation here. Then we see ecosystems like yours that are performing so well with this amazing microbial ecology. And I'm reminded of the work that has never been fully invalidated or disproven, in my opinion, of Louis Kervran on biological transmutation of elements, uh, where he described in the laboratory how he would conduct experiments with solutions or with biological processes that contained minimal levels of calcium and abundant levels of potassium and through biological processes the ratios would become completely inverted and all of a sudden calcium would be abundant and potassium would be depleted and there is too much there that we don't understand and mainstream science would like to immediately discard that subject summarily out of hand and say no that is absolutely impossible it can't possibly happen and yet Kavran had a significant 
enough body of work that he published a book with dozens of experiments that were repeated and replicated over and over again. Anyway, there's this question in the back of my mind. This is not even a conversation we could entertain for many farming ecosystems, in my opinion, because many of them don't have the microbial activity and the microbial profile where this could even happen. Or I shouldn't say it couldn't happen, but not to this degree. There's one other example that comes to mind. And this was the uh, the Lubkis in Austria who pioneered their, what I call their ultimate winemaking approach to making compost and making humus. They were, I forget the distance, but they were downwind within, I want to say 30 miles or 50 miles of Chernobyl. Uh, I, I could be, I'm probably mistaken about the distance, but it was close enough to Chernobyl that uh, they received significant fallout. And the crops on all the neighboring farms in their region had to be destroyed because of the contamination with atomic nuclear waste materials. But they were none detectable on the Lubkis farm. In a matter of months, they were none detectable. So biology changed something. They had an extraordinary biology. And so anyway, I've truly classed myself as a heretic at this point, but uh, I think there's more questions and more homework that needs to be done before I will be satisfied that this doesn't happen. Well, that's very interesting. I'm not sure what I believe, but I will tell you that when I made compost, and I am now the anti-compost, I'm, I'm teasing, but I, I don't make compost anymore. But the compost I learned to make, I learned from the Lubkis. <laughs> they were uh, extraordinary pioneers. I wish their yes. information was more widely known. All right. This has been a fun conversation about orchards. Let's talk about, but actually, no, I, mi I missed, you know, I get so excited talking about these ecosystems. I missed asking the very mundane questions like uh, what has happened to your yields and how do your yields compare with mainstream production practices? The yields in the orchard are very good and comparable. Uh, well, comparable to mainstream organic, mainstream organic. The vegetable yields are lower. The vegetable yields are lower on a per acre basis because I have these uh, wide living mulch rows. In an orchard, you always have wide living mulch rows, right? They're called alleyways. But in vegetables, you don't normally have that. We have basically taken the orchard system I've described and done it with vegetables, except that we strip till the vegetable row every spring. But if you look at it on a per acre basis, we are growing our cover crop every year in the field, right? With our living mulch. So our yields per acre are lower. I want to go back to the orchard just for a bit because there are probably many of our listeners who are unfamiliar with, uh, with orchard systems. How, when you say that you have yields that are comparable to organic systems, uh, how do the organic systems compare to the non-organic systems in the region? Well, in California, the organic, boy, I shouldn't say this because uh, somebody is going to be upset, I'm sure. I'll just say our orchard yields at Woodley Farm, which remember were high enough to make us enough money that we were able to retire to the farm in Oregon. Uh, so economically, we did very well. Uh, the yields, our yields, our poundage yields per acre were lower than the conventional peach production average yields in uh, or highest yields in California. How's that? I could razz you a little bit and say, oh, my goodness, the land in Oregon must be really cheap. Uh, uh, well, it, <laughs> it's, it's cheaper than California. <laughs> yeah, I'm just having fun with you there. Now, obviously, obviously you did very well. All right, thank you for entertaining my uh, persistence with that question. So thinking about your vegetable systems, you described that you were doing a strip till annually before planting and then you're doing the mowing. In the case of the tree fruit, you were also doing a single foliar application mineral spray per year. Are you doing anything like that for the vegetable crops? No, I'm not. And you know, that's interesting that you say that. I, I may have to think about that. So no, we are not spraying for any insects or any diseases in the vegetables. And we hadn't had any problems uh, last year in 2022. Uh, in, yeah, in 2022, uh, we had some pests I hadn't seen. 
after, uh, had anybody noticed that 2022 was particularly dry and particularly hot? <laughs> <laughs> I'm being facetious because we had the hottest temperatures in Eastern Oregon that we'd ever seen. And on some crops that were a little drought stressed, we saw some pests that we hadn't seen before. On the crops that we managed to maintain with uh, high levels of irrigation, we maintained pest-free, generally pest-free, or the, you know, 5 to 10% damage that I, I allow in my system. But the vegetable system, just like the orchard system, the goal is to have as little bare soil within the, the year as possible. But for about a three to four week period, the portion where the crops are going to go, not every crop, some crops can handle um, some no-till, but with, a, with the heavy residue applications beforehand, but for, especially for seeded crops, again, early in the spring, when the grass is starting to grow, well, the living mulches are starting to grow, but it's the grass that I need to suppress in my vegetable systems. That's when I'll come in and when the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the grasses is the lowest. So if I till, I wanna make sure I'm adding microbe food. I don't till unless I'm feeding microbes. So I let it get up to a certain point and then I strip till it. And then, I let it dry out. I wait for the living mulch in between the strip tilled areas to get to be a little taller, succulent and green. And then I mow and blow that into the tilled area. And then I till it again. So I go through with two to three passes, depending on the crop, whether it's a transplanted crop, whether it's a seeded crop, whether it's what I call my weed tolerant crops or my less weed tolerant crops. Depends on whether I do the two to three passes. But every time I do a pass, I either till in something or I mow and blow and till something in. So we never disturb the soil unless we're using it to feed microbes. How wide are your tillage strips that you are doing your strip tillage? And do you use the same strips from year to year? Yes, I use the same strips from year to year, although we have a five-year rotation where we will use the, five, the same strips for five years and then we'll move, right? So we'll move to where the living mulch was for a previous five years. And only then do we seed it because the beauty of this system is with these relatively competitive living mulches is that my whole season after planting is spent suppressing the movement of the living mulch back into that crop row but by the end of the season it's moved back in and i don't have to plant a winter cover crop for free i get cover over the winter for my microbial community, for my beneficial insects, for my spiders and my carabid beetles and my rogue beetles. And I don't have to even spend the money to seed. How cool is that? Coming back to the first part of the question, how wide a strip do you begin with at the beginning? Oh, sorry. <laughs> About 48 inches. Okay. So fairly wide and then a fairly wide row to match that as well. Yeah. So we spoke about the mulch species, the living mulch species that you, or kind of the blend that you have working for you in the orchard system, both in California and in and Oregon. But what are you doing in the vegetable system? Are you also going into the old pasture? Do you have specific species that you've planted? Exactly. So remember in Montana, I tested all different kinds of legumes and legume grasses mixed. And I really liked my perennial clovers, but there were places when I were, would use my annual clovers and my annual medics, and sometimes mix in some annual grasses with them. When we retired, remember we'd made enough money that we didn't have to work hard at it. We said, how hard could it be? 
to have a perennial grass, clover, alfalfa, and weed mix growing amongst our vegetables. What could go wrong? So we, we learned suppression and management techniques to be able to have what we were trying to do was perennialize an annual system. So how do we maintain a perennial area that we've never tilled? Well, or at least we didn't till for the first five years, right? How do we have no tillage in the rotation of an annual system? Does that make sense? Yep. So, so that was what we were trying to do. So we started out with that hay crop that that 50 year old hay crop and then it moved back in and it continues to move back in even when we start tilling another area right we till that area that had been in living mulch i will go through and i'll over sow with a with a clover because as you know with cycles of natural cycles of regeneration what's going to happen is the legumes are going to generally move out and the grasses are going to move in except where we have the vegetables they actually we can keep more legumes in those tilled rows. But anyway, I won't get off on that tangent. How frequently are you doing the clover interceding into the uh, alleyway? Only when I move. So once every five years. Right, exactly. Okay. You gave us some examples of the intention behind the timing of when you are mowing in the orchard system. What is the intention behind the timing of mowing here in the vegetable crops? What's your mowing frequency and the pattern and why is it that way? Good question, because it is different in working with an annual that doesn't have as aggressive a root system. So we start in with that tillage that I just described, the strip tillage, and then we mow the living mulch and get you know added fertilizer. And then we finally plant the crop And then just like any good vegetable grower, I go in and I suppress the annual weeds that will come in early in the season. The timing of course is vital. So I go through and I wheel hoe in between my crops in the strip till row and I let it dry out. And then the living mulch is high enough again that I mow it again and it acts not only as nutrient cycling, I'm adding a, remember I wanted to add the regular, constant, continuous residue addition throughout the season rather than all at once at the spring. So I add another level of residue, but in this case, I've wheel hoed and let it dried out and it also then adds a little bit of a mulch to suppress my weeds. So it's multitasking as fertilizer for continuous nutrient cycling, continuous decomposition for both my crops and my microbial community. It's multitasking as habitat for spiders and rove beetles. It's also a little bit of a mulch for weed suppressant. And then that's how I continue on during the season. I mow as close to the crops as possible, leaving some in the middle of the living mulch row undisturbed for blooming habitat. And then right next to my crops, I'm trying to suppress those grasses so that they won't as quickly move back into the crop row. And at the same time, I'm using they're donating their bodies, the grass weed bodies, as fertilizer and mulch and habitat in the crop row. So periodically, probably we mow about five to seven times. Okay. Uh, one of the questions that comes to mind, we spoke about uh, mowing and blowing in the orchard. And I guess it depends on how much residue that you have, but the mowers that I'm familiar with, I would be concerned about overwhelming young seedlings and and young vegetable plants by blowing grasses into the row. So how do you manage that? (laughs) Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. I managed to do that, of course, in the beginning. We uh, we tried a large scale dry bean and uh, flint corn experiment using this. And yeah, they don't like to be overwhelmed with uh, mulch. I don't do it on seeded crops till they're large enough. I do. I do it mainly on transplanted crops. Exactly. So 
with the seeded crops, I will actually blow away from the crop and then blow it back in later. Okay. I'm glad you asked that question because I had some very yellow looking dry beans and corn when, when I tried to do that, thinking, oh, this will be good to suppress the weeds and the crop. I wonder what it would look like if you put on several inches of mulch um, before the seeds emerged, before the seedlings emerged. My perspective is that they can go through the mulch fairly easily, but once they're emerged, they don't do so well when it's put on top of them. That's a really good question. I've never tried. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to experiment with that and let me know. Well, I'll have an answer for you in about another uh, five days because I've got corn underneath and beans coming through about four inches of grass mulch right now. I really want to know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah. On this journey with the vegetables, what were the major learning experiences? What were the things, the, the unintended consequences that you did not expect? A nutrient immobilization. So if I didn't balance my carbon to nitrogen ratios properly, if I did, you know, of course, obviously in the beginning, I tried to do less tillage and I, I didn't time the mowing and the blowing and the tillage properly. I could get, especially in cold soils, cold spring soils, I could get both uh, nitrogen particularly, but also phosphorus immobilization. And it, it would eventually release, of course, but I would get a, a slow growth. I was always intrigued that, that they would recover uh, because I would run in there with my, you know, my special magic uh, liquid fertilizer mix, which is very close to the mineral mix that we spray on the uh, on the peaches, I would go in and I would do a root drench, but I found that sometimes if I didn't do a root drench, they would still recover. They just wouldn't recover as quickly. The original question was, um, what were the unexpected consequences? When did things not work out? Oh, that's right. Okay. So nutrient immobilization, I had to really time things properly so that in cold spring soils, I didn't have slow nitrogen and phosphorus and sometimes manganese, or excuse me, uh, magnesium uh, availability, but mostly nitrogen and phosphorus. Never have any problems with potassium, by the way, with this high residue system. And then in drought, we, we have to provide enough water. We cannot let these crops get drought stressed with the kind of competition that we're asking them to deal with with the living mulches. I found that if we had any drought stress, we would see poor growth and we would throw the balance over and, and we saw a little bit of... Uh, on radish, for example, we saw a little bit of, uh, of disease that is encouraged when we get it too dry. Usually the microbial population was high enough, but if it was too dry, we threw the balance away from our good guy microbes and towards the disease causing microorganisms. And the other thing that you have to be important, uh, that is important is to watch the climate needs that the crop has. So for example, I can still plant things like my brassicas really early, but I have to cover them with reme if they get cold stressed at all. In that early spring season, they could be a little susceptible to flea beetles and to cabbage worms. But if I cover them and they're not stressed, and of course the covering uh, suppresses the cabbage worms and the flea beetles as well, we have no problems at all. I'd like to better understand the, um, the strip till process and what that role looks like because it occurs to me that you're talking about tilling a strip that's 48 inches wide and then having over time having those grasses and those plants encroach back into that space. But then at the same time, if I'm understanding correctly, you're also mowing up right immediately adjacent to the row of seedlings, which tells me that your strip till process isn't killing the grass fully and that it's still there because you're also talking about competition, moisture competition and so forth. So can you give us an, a bit of an illustration? What does the strip till row look like when you're done with the two or three passes that you make? For the first month, the strip till row looks like almost any conventional vegetable row in that you will see bare soil. 
you might see heavy residue. You know, I don't take so many passes over the field that I break the residue up a lot, but I do try to dry out any of the rhizomatous grass roots, God forbid, right? So I do try to do that. It really, for the first month, looks pretty bare except for the crop. And remember, I've also gone through in between the crop rows and I have wheel hoed at least once and sometimes twice depending on the crop. So it, it looks bare, but if you move over, so let's say we've got, we've got several rows of crop, of seeded crop within the bed. If you get close to that, to the edge of the bed, six inches over, right, would be that living mulch. So that's why I mow as close to the end of the bed as I can so that it can't rapidly encroach. Got it. That makes sense. And I have lots of pictures of this because I know a picture is worth a thousand words. I, uh, I have a whole section in the book on this with, you know, how I do the vegetable system month by month so that you, you can see what it looks like because those of you with inquiring minds want to know exactly what it looks like. And I also put the pictures in because I'm assuming that in different climates and in different places and with some nice young brains at work, you're going to improve upon my system. And so I want you to see what it looks like so you can say, oh, well, what if we did that? With all of the environmental climate and species differences, yes, there needs to be a thousand revisions, a thousand modifications and adapted to local climates all over the place. And that's, you know, that's part of the fun. That's part of the joy is figuring it out. Yes. I actually, I want to ask you a question about figuring it out, but before I go there, we haven't yet spoken about pest pressure on the vegetable crops, and you obviously have less length of experience there in, in your Oregon operation as to what you did with the tree fruit in California, but how have you seen pest pressure evolve at this early stage, if at all? On the Oregon farm, we were doing, uh, basically it was pest free. And so I, I get away with the no spraying uh, until 2022. And then with the drought stress, we saw some cabbage worms and some flea beetles. Uh, no diseases really so far. I'm trying to think, yeah, tomatoes and peppers have been entirely pest free. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you make me laugh. You make me laugh. It's like, uh, yeah, we, we never, it's like diseases were never an issue from the very beginning. And of course you had the benefits of going into soil that has been in pasture for 50 years. And so yes, it hasn't yeah. been compromised, but that is so far outside the realm of what is considered possible or normal by vegetable growers that it wouldn't even be perceived as being a possible reality. Like you must be in never, never land somewhere. And Eastern Oregon is a little never, never land, but uh, in California, <laughs> we were not far from the Sacramento Valley. So, you know, we were right in the middle of, uh, of fruit and vegetable growing areas. And what was your vegetable disease and insect experience in California? We would get powdery mildew on the cucumbers late in the season uh, when the temperatures got cooler, but not early enough in, in the year to be problematic. Basically, no problems with the peppers and the tomatoes, and I've kind of already gone over the fruit pests. What is it that you wish farmers knew or would learn from your experience, and where do you see the greatest need or the greatest area of opportunity for more innovation? So what's kind of innovative about the system that I'm doing with vegetables, trying to perennialize an annual system, is I'm putting into the rotation a perennial, right? So what you said about I had less pest pressure because I was going into 50-year-old pasture, I'm maintaining some of that pasture in the system at all times. So what I use when I consulted, I used to try and get grain rotations and grass rotations into the vegetable systems, right? This system that we have with the living mulch that's multitasking as nutrient cycling, habitat for beneficials, and as 
a material for mulch for weed suppression, it's also allowing me to bring into my rotation a perennial and a grass, a poa family species, well, and legume and some of the forbs, that it's hard to fit into a vegetable rotation, right? And so I think that what I'd really like us to think about is how to take the tenets of good organic farming, which include cover cropping, rotations, these varied and diverse rotations, feeding the soil rather than feeding our crops, to try and think outside of the box more and more with all of those good tenants of farming and how can we do that in different ways perhaps and how can we think less about managing the needs of the crop and more about managing the needs of a plant community over a five-year period or a 10-year period rather than over a weekly or a, a seasonal period this has been such an enjoyable conversation, Helen. What's the question that I missed asking? Oh, I don't think you missed any. And you ask questions that now you've got me thinking. And, you know, I'm supposed to be really retired now, but I've got this four acre alfalfa field out there. And now you've got me thinking, well, John, should I go out there and maybe I should just mow that alfalfa into beds and wow, how am I going to seed into that? I, you've got me thinking. So <laughs> I've got questions for you for later, but I don't think you missed any questions. Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation and I want to say thank you for sharing your lifetime of experience and your husband's experience and sharing all of your wisdom with all of us. It's so valuable and so necessary. You know, I've had the experience entirely too many times in my very short life of uh, knowing people with amazing, incredible, extraordinary knowledge who took took it all to the grave with them. And I uh, was one of the reasons, one of the inspirations for this podcast and for getting it going. And it's, it's, uh, it almost sounds presumptuous of me to, to connect those two things because with the wealth of the lifetime of experience that you have and that many others have, it's impossible to capture... Uh, it's, it's just this tiny little segment of all the stories that you could share and the things that you've learned and the examples that you have. And so I would encourage you to do write the second book. I'm sure the first one's going to be incredibly successful. And uh, to all of our listeners, we'll link to it in the show notes, but it is titled The Ecological Farmer by Chelsea Green. And if you enjoyed this conversation, you need to buy the book because didn't even discuss nearly everything that's in the book at this point. So, Helen, thank you for being here. I've really enjoyed it and look forward to more conversations in the future. Thank you for the opportunity and the idea stimulation. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, Visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.